we go to the next piece. Okay, what is this, uh, uh, Rich? This is um, a, a dagger that I spent a, really an extensive amount of time documenting and researching and studying. And uh, we could do probably a four hour presentation just on this piece. But uh, just to give you some of the highlights, it one, the handle lets you know how small people were when this piece was uh, cast, which would have been between 250 and 450 BC. Um, it has some of the typical spiral decorations on the hilt. It has a single, uh, for lack of a better term, I guess a quillen on one side. Uh, very few daggers of this type have been found. Uh, this comes from, uh, I believe it's more Western Sichuan, maybe Yunnan. Uh, and it's attributed to the Chang culture, which um, is a minority culture that still exists in that region today. Um, there have been only, to my knowledge, less than a half a dozen of this particular style that have been found. Some have the dual quillens. You can tell by looking at it that this one was cast as you see it. Yeah. Uh, the casting on this was incredibly fine. Uh, it has a functional dual fuller down the middle. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that really well in the picture. Yes, I do. Um, that goes very deeply into the blade. The center of that blade is very thick. The edges are still razor sharp. Um, uh, many years ago, when I first acquired this piece, I had it digitally scanned, um, a 3D laser scan done to see uh, if it could be reproduced by modern casting technologies. And so I sent it off, I sent the 3D scans off to uh, three different bronze foundries and only one of them was able to accurately reproduce the dagger. And even that piece, when it came out and after they had a chance to finish it using all our modern technology, it was not as finely done as the one you see in front of you. And uh, that gave me an idea of how skilled these craftsmen were and how difficult these things were to produce back then. It also is a great way of telling modern fakes from the originals, because when you have a piece like this one in your hand, even though it's got some losses to one of the edges and it's got some, some cosmetic damage to it, when you look at this and when you see it under a microscope, when you hold it in your hand, the level of craftsmanship that had to go into creating this is not something that's easily done today. Um, I've got several of the reproductions left here and uh, for anybody that visits I'm always happy to show them the difference between what modern technology could do and what 2500 year old technology could produce. Um, but one of the fascinating things about this particular piece is when I find something like this that's not a, a typical design that's something a little more rare a little more difficult to come by I try to do a, a, a pretty full analysis of them. And the first place I go is to the microscope. And in the next slide or two, you'll see some of the things that I discovered when I put this thing under a microscope. Perfect. Before we go there, just let me just, you know, uh, Rich, the spiral decoration, mm -hmm. you can see it mm -hmm. on Sassanid swords, late, later in a Sassanid sword. Oh. On some, and then and it, it, it's a... On a Celtic theme too. Yeah, and then you can see in you know Yemeni Jambia from 19th and 20th century from Yemen. Mm -hmm. yep. It's I'm interesting familiar. to see you know in different cultures the same decoration, isn't it? Yeah, and and I I think that you know I do believe that things can be uh, you know spontaneously uh, conceived in different unrelated places, but I think that we discount the context of a lot of ancient cultures yes. and the contact that they had with each other. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I don't, I think that a lot of archeology span is, is starting to prove that they were better connected than we used to think that they were. 
Absolutely. You know, I think uh, maybe we talked about it. You know, I, I, trans I have translated lots of uh, Persian manuscripts. And now for one of my books to be published, they talk, it's about 11th century. So they talk about the Rus, but Rus doesn't mean Russians. They called everyone coming from the North Rus, even including the Vikings, right? And then they said the Rus who came to Persia had uh, blades, sword blades, and they were magic because in the middle, they looked like a serpentine. They looked like a snake. You see that? Patent uh, welded yeah. steel. And then they talk mm -hmm. about how they wanted these Rus, okay, they mean Viking, wanted to have right. silver coins. So we gave them silver coins and then they write, they were so naive. And, in, and then they gave us all these beautiful blades with serpentine inside them. You know, back then people mm. were so superstitious, you know. Serpentine inside, know. you know. And it's so wonderful when you read these contacts between different nations and cultures, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things I love about doing this. Yeah. Um, Rich, just before we go ahead, it, 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 it looks like a pommel it has, and there is a hole in it, right? Do, that, do I see it correctly? And so uh, because there's so few examples like this, uh, it could have been an attachment point for a, a stone garnish covering that uh, horizontal section, but it could also have been for some type of a retention lanyard or some type of a decoration of, I don't, I have not found anything that says definitively what that hole would have been used for. And do I understand it correctly? But it's only that on one side. Only on one side. Okay, I just wanted to ask you. Thank you. And regarding the yeah. quillin, is was it like two of them? One is broken, or is it in original shape like that? Okay. That's the original shape, and there is a similar one from the same region and the same culture that has both. But there were several specimens like this that only had a single, and uh, we can. I think we can only speculate as to why that would be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next one. Ah, here you go. Yeah. Okay. So what this is... is one of the first things that I saw when I put this under a microscope. Um, you would think that something, and the magnification here is only 12 power. Um, but these things, when you just look at the surface of the blade, you can kind of tell there's something there. But under the microscope, what I started to discover was not only do we have fossilized insects, and these particular insects are flies, uh, very small, um, muscadae, I believe is the family, uh, house flies, just generic house flies that had fossilized into the surface of the blade. And that is not something that can be done in a short period of time. Yeah. But um, I sent, one of the great things about this particular piece was I actually discovered that there is a field of archaeoentomology and there are active archaeoentomologists and they were stunned by the level of detail uh, preserved in these fossils that were found on the surface of this dagger blade. Um, well, this particular one used to be in my collection. It, it's now in a collection in uh, the northern United States, uh, but I keep asking him if he wants to sell it back. <laughs> it is probably one of my favorite pieces of all time, uh, but it, it is genuinely one of the most unique things I have ever found uh, studying ancient weapons. And the drawing in the lower left-hand corner is uh, a roughly correctly oriented, uh, just pencil and, or pen and ink drawing of the fossil and the way that it sits on the blade at that particular point. Unbelievable. And I believe the next one, I'm trying to remember what the next slide shows. Yeah. But, okay, this is at 100 power magnification. And what is so unique about this is, according to my archaeoentomologist, this was um, probably the larva. And being a soft-bodied organism, it's very rare for larvae to fossilize because they disappear long before that process can take place. Uh, but what you can see is, and this is 
there's no color retouching. There's no modifications done to this photograph. This is what it looks like at 100 power. And this is right near the central um, blood groove on the dagger is this tiny, tiny little fossil of an insect larva that appears as though it was originally in that green sort of malachite matrix that chipped away to reveal that azurite looking matrix where the actual organism fossilized. And uh, that to me is just stunning. It is fascinating, it's unbelievable. So is it like that the larva or the insects after the bronze uh, was cast, they sat on it and then they fossilized there? The, the culture that this came from had a custom of on death, placing the deceased's body inside of a cave for an extended period of time for visitation and for uh, uh, some other religious rites. And possessions would often be placed on the chest with the arms crossed. So the best working theory we've been able to come up with is that this dagger was actually resting on the body when the body became, well, obviously a decaying body would draw flies. Yeah. And there would also be bodily fluids, perhaps fluids from the cave that would collect on the surface of uh, the weapon. Uh, you find different organisms on one side than you find on the other side, which would be more consistent with it laying on an object such as a body, or it could have been laying in the mud for all we know. And then over a shorter period of time, geologically speaking, the environment dried up and allowed those soft bodied organisms and insects to actually be dried onto the surface of the blade where they could then fossilize. And so if anyone else has a better theory, I would love to hear it because this is a fascinating piece. And one of our next slides will show you just kind of the, uh, the, the depth that I'm talking about. These are the recognizable fossils mapped on each side of the blade. And each one was photographed and each one was sketched. And each one was, like I say, mapped and as to its orientation and location on the blade. And overall, there's over 200 of them. There's moths on one side. Uh, you can see the majority, uh, if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see flies and moths on this side, in addition to larva, pupa, and there are some eggs as well. But then on the other side, you only see a moth or two towards the tip, but no full grown um, insects anywhere between the tip and the very pump and the pommel. And that one insect body that you see fossilized on the pommel is actually on the outer edge. That's sort of a rhombic shaped pommel than a, than a flat. Um, and so that's actually, if it was in fact resting on something, um, then that would have been on the side that was exposed to air, where most of the larvae are on the underneath side. So that's the best theory that I can come up with. But uh, I'm working on a, on a lengthy report that documents all of these. And it'll end up being 50 or 60 pages at least, I imagine. Of course. And aren't uh, all these insects, larvae, and all of them, could you... Uh identify them, which type of insect or larva or whatever? My uh, archaeoentomologist was able, I think, to identify them down to family, only on the flies. Uh, he said they identified the species by their wing structure and the venation in the wings. Uh, the moths were not fossilized clearly enough to make a determination, but the flies were. Um, and I have that document here somewhere, but I did not include it with the material that I sent to you. Sure, it's magnificent. Please let me know when you have it published, Rich. That's amazing. It, it may be one of those things where it never actually gets published, but it gets put in my archives and, and shared with people that have interest. So it'll, it'll be a, a considerable file size, but, uh, uh, I can I can definitely make sure you get some of it. Thank you very much. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay, so 
this was it, I think, right? What we talked okay. about. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't sure how long that would take. No, that's a perfect. That's good. We are going to, if you wish, we will continue talks on weapons, on these uh, bronze or iron weapons from different cultures. You shared very beautiful items with us. Thank you very, very much. And uh, so I would like some ideas for things to talk about later as well. Yes, absolutely. And uh, just one uh, thing I would like to ask you, uh, Rich. Regarding the market for collections of uh, antiques or ch Chinese bronze or iron items, uh, is there like a big interest in collecting items uh, from this um, area and era? There is, there's always someone who will collect anything. Um, there are artifact collectors in pretty much every country I know of. Um, the U.S. seems to have less of them because we didn't really have a Bronze Age civilization here. Um, our, our history is more, uh, the indigenous American people were more fractured as, as tribes go and didn't really follow the same types of evolutions that were found in other countries. So what you do see in America is people who collect Native American artifacts because those are things that can be found here. Yeah. So we don't see a whole lot of people in this country that collect these types of objects, but there are a few and um, certainly, um, you know, more than a couple of dozen, but uh, you'll see them at museum auctions and Christie's and Sotheby's and Bonham's and Hermann's and uh, all the big auction houses will sell these things. And I'm sure they have, customers in every country. Yes, I think one of the biggest concerns of uh, people when they collect antiques, whatever antique it is, doesn't need to be weapons. It could be painting, it could be anything, right? Is the possibility mm -hmm. of buying a fake, right? We all know that, Rich, right? right. And but, these, uh, particularly Chinese bronzes, there are more fakes than you would probably ever believe. Uh, just go to eBay, you'll see <laughs> tons of people selling things that they purport to be from the Warring States or the Shang or the Zhou or any other time. And I have not seen an authentic antiquity on eBay in decades. Decades, yes, that's right. So that's what people, yeah, of course, everyone needs to be careful. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Rich, for sharing your knowledge with us. And I, we are going to have you back on this channel hopefully soon. And I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.